Thank you. Uh, I was told to start talking when the music stops, so I was yelled at about that. So I'm a little nervous because they're all yelling at me about this. You know, I'm a timid guy. <laughs> I'm kind of nervous about this talk because I've only given it like three or four times. I'm going to be talking about something that is so controversial that a lot of you are going to think I'm a, a heretic, a blasphemer. You already know I don't need commentary from the audience. You know, they're talking. I'm, uh, I'm going to be talking about where the temple is located, the, 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 the Temple of Solomon. A lot of people have pro made this proclamation over the years. Um, most people, most all people unanimously accept that the Temple of Solomon is on the Temple Mount complex that you see, that big iconic picture of the gold dome over in Israel. Uh, can I get back to that uh, picture there? There we go. This is where everybody says that the temple should be located, on the Temple Mount, 36-acre complex, massive complex. I'm going to be talking to you this evening about the theory that it's not on the Temple Mount, that it's in the city of David about 600 to 1,000 feet south of there, and that the biggest archaeological blunder in the history of the world has occurred with trying to identify where the temple is located. That's a big statement. I'm a little nervous about making it, but I'm going to try and lay out the case tonight. A lot of people have asked me, though, before I get started, they've come up to me and said, how did you ever get involved in searching for lost locations in the Bible? I've been on 55 expeditions over 28 years. I've been arrested five times in the Middle East, twice in Iran. There, I, I, I like to tell you, don't get arrested in Iran. The food is bad. The room service is worse. <laughs> but people say to me, how did you ever get involved in this? I mean, you, you were writing books. I have nine books. I'm, I'm doing a lot of television, history, National Geographic, those kind of shows. And I went from being a policeman. So can I just tell you a little bit about how I got started? Uh, years ago, uh, I was 12 years old at the time. And my, I had a father who was a heavy drinker. Uh, Dad liked to uh, partake on, on Saturday nights. He was a bartender for 45 years. So come Sunday, uh, Dad was just not fun to be around. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, violent several times. Uh, I've been struck several times. And uh, I knew that I just needed to get out of the house on Sunday morning because he woke up at 10 o'clock like clockwork. The football games began at about 12. So that little window of being around the house, it means he'd be pretty tough to be with. A lot of yelling, a lot of shouting, a lot of anger. It just wasn't a place I wanted to be. So every Sunday from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, I rode my bicycle around the neighborhood. And as I rode my bicycle around the neighborhood one day, I saw a church, and it had outside a sign that said, free donuts, <laughs> free cocoa. And I couldn't believe it. You know, there's, didn't have any money in my pocket. I couldn't do anything, so I pulled my bike up and parked it there by the, the side of the church in Mesa Verde in Southern California. And uh, I walked in. Uh, up, up to the portico there and before I went into the front doors of the church a lady was there and she handed me a donut and she said would you like some cocoa and I said how much she said it's free I said wow this is great and then I ate the donut and I said can I have another one she says have as many as you want it's free and have as much cocoa as you want it's free I said this is a great thing all of a sudden the crowd started moving into the church and I was kind of shuttled in with them <laughs> And I'm sitting in the back, and I'm saying, this is awesome. I could smell the flowers and see the beautiful sunlight streaming through the blue stained glass windows of various colors. 
And I'm thinking, this is great. And then they passed in front of me a plate full of money. I said, free money. I took $5 and passed it along. I didn't know. I'd never been to church. My father and mother had never taken me to church, ever. I didn't know the protocol. I just figured they're passing out money to get people there, you know. Well, after church, they had a softball game, and I was a good athlete. I got a scholarship for football to Fresno State, and I was a good athlete, good baseball player. And so I went out there, and I played, and of course, I was, you know, showing them I was pretty good at that, and I couldn't wait for the next week. I went there, free donuts, three cocos, got another $5 and played. <laughs> I should have taken more because they weren't catching on or anything. A year goes by and I get the, the, an award for the best attendance, perfect attendance. <laughs> and the church got together and, and paid for me to go to a Christian youth camp. You know one of those come to Jesus camps that you send your kids to? And I get there and you know what? They're giving you more donuts. <laughs> Friday night, the last night, when they're going to lead you down the aisle, you know what they do? They feed you full of donuts and sugar. That's, it, it, you know what? This is a conspiracy. <laughs> Christians will sugar you up. Notice every time you have an event with Christians, they give you a lot of sugar. It's all to get you worn down. Well, I, uh, I accepted Christ, and uh, then as I, as I went on in life and I, and I graduated uh, from, from college, I, had to, I, I, said, I said, I have to figure out uh, what, what am I going to do for a career what is my career path going to be? And um, I said, well, I'm going to be a policeman. I'm already addicted to donuts. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to break that habit, right? You get those donuts all the time. And I became a policeman. There were free donuts there. So I became a policeman. And... Uh, I remember uh, that the greatest job I had, I, I was a crime scene investigator. I graduated from the FBI Homicide Institute due, through, through some grants and whatnot. And so, but the best job was in being a motorcycle officer. Some of you have heard this story. I have to tell it for those of you who haven't heard it. Um, when you're a motorcycle officer, you wear a T-shirt and old Levi's. You go for about three months, and you, you drive around on these old, beat-up, wobbly-wheeled motorcycles. They're all rusted and held together with bailing wire. But then the day comes when you graduate and they wheel out this incredible motorcycle bathed in chrome, lights all over the thing. It's gorgeous. And then they give you a new uniform that very same day. And so you put on these high black shiny boots and tight-fitting blue pants with a gold stripe going down the side, teardrop sunglasses, white helmet, silver eagle, black gloves, shiny badge, get on the motorcycle, fire it up, drive out into, into, in, in, onto Harbor Boulevard there, and I'm driving down, and I'm saying to myself, I wonder what I look like. And there was a Kmart with a long row of windows. I looked over, and I said to myself, you're the man. <laughs> I look good. And just then, as I'm looking at myself in the mirror, a young lady backs up in a yellow Volkswagen. And I hit her and went on to my shiny little tight blue pants there. And the supervisors came and said, we can't have a guy who's ADD driving around a motorcycle. So they assigned, they, they assigned me to homicide investigation. I guess they figured, what harm could I do that somebody's already dead on the ground with a white chalk outline going around them? And then I, uh, you know... I found out that I was a pretty good investigator, you know, and you find this out. A lot of guys couldn't find the evidence. I, could, I said, hey, there's, look at that blood drop there. And the, the other officers went, eh, the detective said, no, I can't see it. And then I look at that little scrapbook, and I realized I have this gift, this gift of investigation. And then uh, uh, um, I, I went to court, and I found out that evidence isn't proof. It's the proper ter interpretation of evidence that's the proof. They'd get some slick attorney on one side. He'd spin all the information, and the guy would go free, and we had all this evidence. And I learned that evidence isn't proof. It's the proper interpretation of evidence that is the proof, and that's what we're dealing with as 
those that are students of the Bible is trying to figure out what it says, what it means, what is the accuracy of it. You know, we have, don't we have such a division in our country today of, you know, people, you know, Republicans and Democrats and people that are defense attorneys and prosecuting attorneys. And you, you people married know that you see things differently, don't you? Anybody? <laughs> the men are so afraid to say yes. <laughs> They're sitting there like meek. Uh, what do I say? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to admit, just about, you know, a little while ago, I got an argument with my wife, a little bit of a discussion there. And I felt that I was right, and she felt that she was right. And we had a little bit of a stare. And in the wisdom of Solomon, to avoid the, the argument escalating, I said, if you admit I'm right, I'll admit I'm wrong. She says, cool, you go first. I said, I'm wrong. She says, you're right. <laughs> How do you deal with that kind of logic? I met a man named Jim Irwin, uh, the eighth man to walk on the moon after that. I, I, I got in a bad shootout. I talked about the, the I did a little uh, uh, explanation of that of a breakout session before, but I need to tell you, I, I was partners with, uh, I, I left the police department after a very bad shootout, and I went, a man died, and then, and then I went to uh, Colorado, and, and I met a man named Jim Irwin, the eighth man to walk on the moon, first one to drive the car on the moon. How do you remember seeing the astronauts walk on the moon? Okay, a lot of you know what's going to be said right here in a minute. Oh, say, how many, people, how many people saw it live on the moon, walking, on TV? Okay, those of you who did not, stay seated. You don't, okay. But those that saw it on TV live, would you please stand up? Those of you who are seated, look at these people, because this is what you're going to look like when you're really old. <laughs> scary, isn't it? <laughs> you know, meeting a man that's... Well, and Jim said he, he, he stood on, on the pedestal of eternity, and he stood on the moon. He said he raised his vi visor and looked towards the earth, and there it was, green, brown, white, and blue, this, like, Christmas tree ornament in the vast black canopy of space, which is a zone of death. He said, nothing lives. And here's this earth living and pulsing and breathing, warm, home. And he said, at that time, he knew that there was a master creator. And this was not a cosmic accident. He came back to earth, and he started saying, look, I'm going to go look for Noah's Ark. I'm going to start looking for lost lo locations in the Bible. Uh, I teamed up with Jim, and that started it all. That journey from the moon to here, from the motorcycle, here I am today. And, uh, and, and I've looked for the real Mount Sinai. That you, some of you have seen that. Uh, we've looked for the Ark of the Covenant, which we think is in Ethiopia. By the way, I'm taking a tour over there January 16th to the 25th. It's a phenomenal tour if you want it. At our table, we give you information on that. We're, we're, we're taking about 30 people on an expedition. Uh, I've looked for uh, the lost shipwreck of Paul. Uh, with Chuck Missler and I went over and, and uh, looked for the shipwreck of Paul. We think we found uh, and I identified. We didn't find them. The divers did in the late 60s and early 70s. But we've identified them as coming from Paul's shipwreck in the exact place that Luke said, in 90 feet where two seas come together. It's a phenomenal story of how accurate the Bible is and how, how Luke is chronically accurate. Uh, we've looked for Noah's Ark, Mount Sinai, Paul Shipwreck, Ark of the Covenant. More recently, we've been doing research on the temple. I've never realized that I could spark such a firestorm. Now, I didn't come up with this, with this brainchild of this being, of the temple being in the city of David. Uh, Ernest Martin and others, and uh, I'm told that archaeologists from Israel even mentioned it uh, in uh, off the record and behind the corners to uh, archaeologists from the United States. But a lot of people have been talking about the temple not being on the Temple Mount. Uh, I'm going to now go through a process of hopefully uh, edifying you as to what, what, uh, what, what I think is the, the true location of the temple. Uh, being human, we could all be wrong, but I think the Bible is crying out, history is crying out that, uh, that the temple is not on the Temple Mount. And the implications of this are humongous. Uh, I may be wrong, but William Welty tells me I'm right, and so that's sort of a, that's sort of a, a gold stamp. Uh, I've had such good conversations with him and other professors from around the country, 
Uh, scholars have been calling me at a vast, at a really brisk pace, and uh, most of them are saying, "Hey, I think this is right." And so, uh, let's start off with Matthew uh, 21, one through two. I'm going to go through an explanation without going through the 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 the. the the PowerPoint, and then I'll jump into the PowerPoint, and we'll go over this, but I just want to go through some of these clarifying things without having to even distract to the screens, but we'll be going there. But if you can stay with me for just about five minutes, giving you an overview, all right? Matthew 21, 1 through 2, uh, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to call his attention to its buildings. Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. A lot of people have said that this one verse excludes the Temple Mount from being the temple location because we have over 10,000 massive stones that are still existing. The Jews around the Temple Mount tell me this is Jesus being in error with this verse. He prophesies that all these stones will be thrown down, yet you have thousands and thousands of stones in the most ancient of monoliths that are still standing on planet earth and people say well that's the foundation stones Jesus if you listen to it carefully he says Jesus left the temple and was walking away he had left the temple and was downhill by then and they're looking up and he says you see all of this all these buildings everything not one stone will be left upon another and yet we have thousands and thousands of stones Titus in 70 AD went and destroyed the temple Josephus describes it like this he said you wouldn't even know that there was a building there it was so utterly decimated that it was like you take a huge tree roots and all and just take it from the earth's grip and cast it aside It was a barren, empty place after the destruction of the temple. Josephus says that it was such a a barren field for so many years that um, that, that literally not even a pebble was left. Now, what is this huge stone structure that we see sitting on the Temple Mount today. What, what is this if it's not the location of the temple? Scholars have been for years trying to find the Roman fort. The no, Roman fortress called Fort Antonia. Fortress Antonia. And yet they have never been able to find it. And if you read books on it, they'll say there, it's a mystery where this fort is located. Now, we've got to understand, from 63 B.C. to 289 A.D., the Romans had their major presence throughout that entire vast region right there in Jerusalem. And yet they can't find one stone of it? The reason they can't find one stone of it is because it's been sitting right in front of them. The stone, the walls that you see around there is 36 acres. Josephus says that there was a a legion there that's about 6,000 soldiers with 4,000 support personnel. So the fortress, Josephus describes as a city. He not only just says it's the size of a city, he says it's the size of several cities with roads and barber shops and granaries and brothels and, and, and places to worship and, and furriers and, and barracks for the officers and barracks for the soldiers and all the people and all the food storage and the restaurant, everything. And they haven't found one stone in Jerusalem because that huge monolith there was the fort for the Romans and not the place of the temple. Eliezer, you know the story of Masada. A lot of you have been to Masada, I'm assuming. On, you've been up there, and it's, it's a pretty harsh climate. But um, the general up there, who was the one that encouraged everybody to do the suicidal uh, episode there, he says, it, Jerusalem, is now demolished to the very foundations and hath nothing left but that monument of it preserved. 
I mean the camp of those, the Romans, that hath destroyed it, which still dwells upon its ruins. He is telling us that there's nothing of the temple, just like Josephus. And he's saying that the only thing that's left is the camp of the Romans. It wasn't destroyed. So where is the temple? I'm going to go through a walk through Scripture right now. And we're going to go back through a PowerPoint in a few minutes so you can see this, but I'd just like to go through this for, for an overall viewpoint. 2 Samuel 5, 7 says, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion that is the city of David. This was uh, Jerusalem 3,000 years ago didn't have this big, huge complex with a gold dome. It was just a big rock protrusion. The only thing that was in Jerusalem at the time was just this south, which would be this direction, going backwards from this slide. And it was a 12-acre high-walled fortress of the Jebusites. That's all that was there. Everything around it was just wasteland. But this 12-acre Jebusite fortress was there, and that's what David wanted. And the people that were on the rampart walls hollered down and said, hey, even a blind and the lame could defend this fortress. That's how big it was. The Kidron Valley went down much deeper because of erosion now and has brought it in silt, has brought it up. It was really a steep-walled fortress. You can go there today and you can see that's where the Gion Springs are. That's the city of David. If you've gone through Hezekiah Tunnel, that is where the city of David is, a 12-acre area, and there was nothing else around it. And David wanted this. It was a plum of a fortress, and it had water coming from the Gion Springs. And the people said, you can't even conquer this with a blind person or a lame person. But they sent up people through the water shaft, conquered the city, and now David had control. What the first thing we know of from Scripture that David did was he was contacted by an angel of the Lord and said, by the threshing floor. In the city of David, which the Bible says in 2 Samuel 5, 7, is the stronghold of Zion. The first thing he was told to buy the threshing floor. We're going to get to that in a little while. So important about buying a threshing floor, which means he had the title deed of it. He didn't just take it. He was offered it for free, but God, you know, the angel of the Lord said, you buy this. I want you to own this. I want you to have the deed of trust of this forever because this is an important piece of real estate. Joel 3.17 says, So you shall know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. My holy mountain is, from Isaiah, is the temple. So it says, So you shall know that I am the Lord your God dwelling where? In Zion, my holy mountain. That's in the Jebusite fortress. Then we have 2 Chronicles 3.1, which should seal it. It should end the argument of where the temple is located. It says, Now Solomon began to build the temple at the house of the Lord at Jerusalem at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. I must have read that verse so many times without ever even making the connection. Why would he buy a threshing floor? Why would an angel of the Lord, after he takes the city of David, and this is where the Bible says that the temple is going to be built. Does anybody see where this is in error? It says, began to build the temple where? On the threshing floor. Why is the threshing floor so very important? The threshing floor is so very important. We go to Matthew 3.12. He says, Christ winnowing... Now, now we're, we're talking about a future temple. You know that there's two more temples to be built. The tribulation temple and the millennial temple. Christ will build it over the threshing floor, over the Gion Springs in the city of David. Matthew 3.12 says, His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he shall thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff 
with unquenchable fire. The whole point of this threshing floor thing is that this is where Christ will rule and reign and he will wave his winnowing fan and he'll separate the believers from the non-believers and the believers go to the barn, which is heaven, which is a good place and the non-believers go to an unquenchable fire. See how important the threshing floor is? Why the temple has to be there? That's where he will rule and reign? The big problem with all this, how this all got messed up in the first place, was that when the city of David was, when the temple was destroyed and the city of David was just decimated to a plowed field. There's several references. Eusebius talks about it as being a plowed field. Micah, there's prophesies that it'll be a plowed field. It'll be, it's where the, the Turkish women used to bring their menstrual uh, napkins and, and collect them, the Ottomans, and they'd bring them and dump them at a place on, in the city of David because they wanted to have an affront to, to God because they knew where it was. The, 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 the Jews from Tiberias uh, were contacted in the 7th century. They contacted the, the Caliph of Omar and they said, hey, we want to build our city. And he said, well, where, where do you want to build your houses at? And they said, we want to build it in the Gion, over, over the Gion Springs in the market of the Jews which is the city of David. They knew in the 7th century. See, history and the Bible all says it should be there in the city of David. But how did it get messed up? The word Zion has messed this thing up. The stronghold of Zion. Zion, well, the stronghold of Zion was the city of David. And then after it was destroyed, it was gone. This moniker of Israel, this nexus of Israel to God, it, it's, it's, this is gone. And where did it go? Without a place, it had to be invented. Somebody over the centuries and centuries and centuries all of a sudden said, it's in the upper city, in the south part of the upper city. If you go to Jerusalem today, the road signs say Zion. Where? The upper city. Not. And it should have been brought back to the city of David when the Hezekiah's tunnel was uncovered and the Gion Springs were uncovered. But it wasn't. That is the pedigree of Zion. And it wasn't brought back. To this day, it's still not brought back. So Zion was cut loose from its moorings and drifted off to another place. And many places have been suggested as Zion. But the real Zion is in, according to Scripture, the city of David. How is this important? Why is this so important? If you read Psalm 138 and 13, it says, Arise, the Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. His dwelling place is going to be in the temple. The ark of your strength is the ark of the covenant. Psalm 2.6, yet I have set my king on my holy hill in Zion. My holy hill is the temple. Where in Zion? Psalm 102, for the Lord has, shall build up Zion. For he looked down from the heights of his sanctuary from heaven, the Lord viewed the earth. Isaiah 2.3, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, for out of Zion shall go forth the law. Isaiah 24, 23, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion. Psalm 2, 6, yet I have set my king on my holy hill, Zion. Psalm 22, may he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. Psalm 9, 11, sing praise of the Lord who dwells in Zion. Joel 3, 17, so you should know that I am Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Of course, and I said in Isaiah, that is the temple location, my holy mountain. Joel 3, 21, for the Lord dwells in Zion. Psalm 65, 1 and 4, praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. Isaiah 66, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. Joel 3, 17, the Lord your God dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. Is this, is, is this gives anybody chills like it gives me? I've read this so many times. But I can't believe that the Bible is completely and totally clear on the issue. Yet, there are a lot of pastors that have gone over there on tour groups, and they've said, this is the temple location. And they've prayed there and sung songs. And I respect that. That's an, that's, an, that's an earnest thing to want to do because everybody said that. And if you don't contest thing in life, you never find the truth. Hum a humble spirit brings about wisdom. You have to first say you're wrong. You have to say, you, you say this is uncontested. Wait a second. Chuck Missler told me that you test everything. And out of the testing, out of the fire, out of the crucible comes the gold of truth. 
You don't just take something at face value. And, and a lot of pastors and a lot of scholars and a lot of people, a lot of people are mad at me for coming forth with this and putting it in a book and proclaiming this publicly because the implications to this are unimaginable. Eusebius, the curator of the library of Caesarea, the father of church history, the hill called Zion in Jerusalem, the building there, that is to say the temple, the holy of holies, the altar of whatever else was there, dedicated to the glory of God, have been utterly removed and shaken down. The hill called Zion, at Jerusalem, the building there, that is to say the temple. Eusebius, the curator of the library of Caesarea, is saying that it's where? In Zion. Hecadius of Abdera, from the time of Alexander the Great, said the temple was nearly in the very center of the city of David. The pilgrim of Bordeaux in 333. The pilgrim of Bordeaux goes over, and he, we don't know who he is, but we know of his writings, and I don't know who the guy is, I don't know his trust, tr tr trustworthiness, but he wrote a, a diary, and he said, I, w I, I was at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and I looked due east, and I saw the long wall of a Roman fort. You go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre today, and you get on top, and you look east, and we did. There, there's a Lutheran chapel right there. It's really easy to get up. You can see it, and all you see is the whole, from eye to eye, like this wall of this room, and I'm looking at this wall. That's all I see, and he says, that is the Roman fort. And then he goes, that's the, the, that's the praetorium, and he says, on the peak, on the pinnacle of the rock up there is where Jesus stood and was pronounced guilty by Pontius Pilate. So look at the irony of this. That gold dome, which is considered to be the third most holy site in all Islam. Jews aren't even allowed to go up there and pray. Underneath it is a rock pinnacle. And directly under the center of that dome is that rock protrusion. I've been in there. And that's where the pilgrim of Bordeaux said that Jesus was pronounced guilty. Flavius Josephus says you can't see the temple from the north of the city. If you look at that gold dome, go on the other side of it, and that's where he was standing when he said that. He looked and he says, hey, you can't even see the temple. Well, wait a second. All you'd see was the wall because the temple's downhill on the other side. Now, the key piece of this puzzle is the Gion Springs. How many of you have been in the Gion Springs? You've gone over there. A lot of you, okay? You describe it. Let me just, tell me if I'm describing it right. It's, it's this, this tunnel of rock that goes through to the south end of the city of David. It starts at the Gion Springs. You probably went in, what, it was up to your knees around that, your thighs, some of you. It's cold, right? It's dark in there, but it's fun to go through, right? Let me tell you how important that place is that you went. 1 Kings 138 through 39. Zadak the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the son, Jehodiah the Cheriathites and the Paleothites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and took him to Gion. Okay, you got the setting? Solomon's being taken down by these prophets and all these cool guys and they're going down where on a mule? And they're going to the Gion Springs where you went. Then Zadok the priest took a horn of oil from the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. You hear what's it saying here? The tabernacle is there. The ark is there. Why? Because the threshing floor is there. They went in and got the horn of oil from the tabernacle. The ark was for 38 years in Jerusalem before it was put in Solomon's temple by Solomon. It's placed there by David in a tent. And the scripture is saying here that that's where the tabernacle was. Joel 3.18, a fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord in the city of David at the Gion Springs. Aristius, a half century after Alexander the Great, there is an inexhaustible reservoir of water that, as would be expected from an abundant spring gushing up naturally from the temple. The Roman historian Tacitus, roughly 400 years after Aristius, recorded that the temple had a natural spring of water that welled up from its interior. Dead Sea Scrolls, you shall make a channel round the, the labor within the building. The channel runs from the building of the labor to a shaft, goes down and disappears in the middle of the earth so that the water flows and runs through it and is lost in the middle of the earth. Ezekiel 47, 
Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. The water comes from the right side of the temple. It also comes from the right side of Christ. See the symbolism here? See that all that's going on? Chuck Mister has taught me there's nothing in the Bible that's too minuscule to not pay attention to because it all harmonizes and has synchronicity and purpose in our understanding of God's word. I'm going to go to the, to the slides right now or to the PowerPoint. Uh, and I, I, can't, I can't overstate how reverent people are the Jews are that go there and pray with their families as they have with their father, their grandfather, and their fathers, 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 fathers. For over 400 years they've gone there and they place little prayers and they, they place their, their foreheads against the cool stones and they lift their prayers to God in a reverent way. I can't tell you how, how much I, I enjoy seeing how they're praying and how they're worshiping with their families. You see that father in the middle they're holding is by his son. I think it might be possible that they're praying to the very stones of the very fort that destroyed them and persecuted them so much. But tradition is so strong. It's like a cement mixer going through history and dumping its load on on things, and then it gets calcified, and we never can chip through it. But the Bible can. The Gold Dome is is, is called a lot of things. A lot of people call it the Mosque of Omar. It's not a mosque, and Omar didn't build it. More, more, uh, more specifically, it's called the Dome of the Rock, the, the Holy Enclosure, the, all those kind of things that are talked about. The, and so it's, it, the, this has been around a long time. This was, this was around long before the Crusades even. Uh, this, this building uh, is, is the 8th eight, century, I think, I believe it was, it was built. Um, but today, the Jews cannot go up there and worship. They can't even bow a head or they're going to get get anger like because through some political posturing the dome of the rock the the temple mount complex is controlled by arabs by islam by muslims jews are not allowed up there forbidden if we ever try to take a shovel to this ground or a jew ever goes over and takes a shovel the the Arabs have said 1.2 billion of them will amass in, in annihilation and come against war against Israel. That's why it's in control. But every day there's a bloodbath, or every day, there, not every day, but every, uh, frequently there's bloodbath. More people have been killed at the temple complex than any other place on planet Earth. There's more strife gone there, all, going all the way back to, to David through the Crusades, and we just see war after war on this place. Now, this is a very interesting picture. If you look at the upper part, that is the Roman fortress. Uh, it, as it was believed to be the, as, this in the, as the second temple or Solomon's temple. I know, I know there was other people that built Zerubbabel and whatnot. But, but here, let, let's just go with the first temple and the second temple. The first temple was Solomon's second temple here. Okay, look at this upper picture. The lower part is the modern placement. The upper is the suggested traditional temple mount uh, with Solomon's temple. I think this is wrong because I want you, I want you to see and you, I, I don't want you to laugh at this but scholars and all Bible dictionaries that I have read and all encyclopedias place the Roman fort that little corner, you see that little corner up there in the upper left and the upper one? You see that? Let me, let me enlarge it for you. You see this? That is said to be what? The Antonia Fortress. That's where 10,000 people were. Do you see the problem here that we have? Do you see when we have 10,000 support personnel approximately jammed in that by an area not much bigger than two of these buildings here? Oh, is is it? Thank you very much. This is ludicrous. But scholars will say that is where the Roman fort is. And I say that entire area up there was a Roman fort. That red area there was a Roman fort. 
These are Roman fortresses around the world. Various different, different fortresses. They were all built pretty much the same. They were a city, most of them rectangular, in the same size as what we see in Jerusalem. I just put three of them on here, but there's literally hundreds that you can see around the world. And my, if you go on the internet, you can just go, look at this. This is, the, this is what a Roman fortress was. This is how big it was. And these were not in areas as big as Jerusalem and the millions of Jews that would come there and, and, and worship during, during Holy Weeks. You go back to Matthew 21, 1 through 4. Not one stone will be standing upon another. Look at what you see looking up. Now Jesus, I don't know if he was here, but you know, when you leave the temple, you pretty much go downhill in, in most directions. Look at what you have here. Not one stone will be standing up another because this wasn't t taken down. This still exists. Now we'll go back to the Jebusite fortress, okay? Here's the Jebusite fortress. Around it, there was nothing. Now we're going back 3,000 years. Really, this was just the embryonic uh, moments of, of David and Solomon. and It's just a walled-in fortress. It has water. And this is all that was there. This is where the temple should be. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion that is the city of David. So you shall know that I'm the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. My holy mountain equals temple. Now this is uh, uh, John Peterson, uh, Dave Koshel. They, they're, they're, they're having a beautiful painting done of this. This is the early part. And guys, is this, uh, this has been amended, right? It, it, it's quite a bit different, but this is sort of the first blush that was sent. A, a famous uh, Russian artist decided to paint this. You can see up above the, the temple mount. You see down below the city of David and the correct location of the temple. The red arrow goes to what is the temple mount today, which is a Roman fortress. The yellow arrow goes to the temple in the city of David. Then we have the Second Chronicles 3.1 verse, which I love, on the threshing floor in the city of David. Here's the city of David. First Kings verse, going down to the Gion. Verses about... Now, all these verses are directly relational to Zion and the city of David and the temple. There are, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 13 14. When the Crusaders went uh, in about 1099, uh, they were there in the summertime, and on uh, July 13th, they assaulted with siege towers. They, they, they broke their way into the Temple Mount complex, and behind there you can see that dome, the Golden Dome. And what they did is they went on top of that and they wrenched off the crescent moon and they replaced it with a cross and they anointed it as Templus Domini, the Lord's Temple. And the tradition just stuck. In fact, in the first, second, and third centuries, they didn't know where the temple was after distance and time and space. In the fourth century, they had four locations suggested. By the time 1178 came along, without any finality of concession or, or consentment, a guy named Benjamin Tudela, a very charismatic guy, said, look, we got to settle on a place. we got to know where the temple is. So here's the temple. Okay? It's it. He's the one that said it's there. This is, this is Eli Shukran. You see Bonnie there, who who's works with Base Institute. That's myself. I met with this man. What you're about to see is astounding. I went with Chuck Missler down there, Lewis, Ron. We all went, Bonnie. This is Eli Shukran. He's the director of archaeology in the city of David for 20 years. He found the Pool of Siloam. He's over, he, he oversaw all every rock and stone and bag of dirt that's been taken out. And I met with him and I told him about where we thought the city, of, where, where we thought the temple should be over the Gion Springs area. And he said, what are you saying? I went through the whole ex explanation for him. And he took us down. And Chuck went down there about a year later. And uh, I, I still can't believe what, what we're seeing down here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is 30 feet underground. 30 feet from the Gion Springs. It's dated to be 
Some say from Melchizedek. First Solomonic Temple area, I believe. It is an area that uh, was used during Solomon's time. Chuck believes that it is Melchizedek involvement as well. Uh, in the floor, you can see the oil press of the olive oil that would be pressed into, uh, into the oil. The olives would be put in there and put in oil. How is this important? Because Josephus tells us that the Aaron, before he went into the temple himself, was anointed with blood, uh, oil, and, and running water. The water then was in the desert, was from the split rock, but here we have the gushing. You see, you need rushing water to be the place or the temple. Up on the temple mount, there is no water. They had to bring in two aqueducts from South Bethlehem and run them to the temple for their water. They couldn't put a toe. They couldn't take a drop of water from the Gion Springs because it was the holy water of the priests that washed themselves before they went into the temple. They wouldn't have walked a half a mile up Sears or, or, or a quarter mile up, up to the Temple Mount. Here we have an olive oil press. Now, what did we talk about? Zadok the priest went in and got the horn of oil from the tabernacle. This could be a very stone that Solomon was anointed with. The oil was crushed and then put in the horn of oil in the, right above, right above them. Where? In the Gion Springs. Doesn't that what say in 1 Kings? Right there. Here's the oil. Here, here's the, that's my boot there I'm photographing down. That is uh, the, where they made the oil. These are channels in the floor where blood goes. They sacrificed. Now look at these rooms. They're all beautifully carved into limestone. They are below ground, and every temple has been built one on top of another. You have to understand that they're laminated on another because Jesus says, this is where I, will, where I will rule and reign forever. Scripture tells us all over that the first temple, is the second, it just, just gives a lineage of placement that it needs to be right here. I believe what you're seeing, and they just discovered this, you're one of the first groups to see these photos, by the way, of this. Now, look at the rings, the holes in the walls. You know what that is? Can, you, can your eyes adjust? I put the two yellow things there to try and make it uh, clearer for you. But that's a hole in the corner of the limestone where they clamped the rings and they tied up the animals and they did sacrifice. Uh, Eli Shukran told me that they, had, they found thousands and thousands of animal bones there where they had evidence of doing a lot of uh, blood sacrifices. This is one from a cop that really is a clincher for me. And it says in Acts 21.30, and all the city was disturbed. Remember the, the, the story of Paul at the temple? He was accused of offering improper offerings at the temple, bringing in Gentiles. He said, and all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Okay. From a cop's standpoint, visualize this. Dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. And then uh, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. Okay, and then it talks about the, the commander taking him up. But you see where it says here? He immediately took soldiers and ran down to him. When the commander of the garrison was notified, he went down the steps. Now, can anybody in this room convince me that there are any steps coming down to the traditional Temple Mount from any Roman fort in the sky? The only way this makes sense is the Bible says they went down the steps, got him at the temple, and then took him back up the steps. Josephus says that the Romans overlooked the temple and that there was, we, we have Josephus saying, you see in the back there, just beyond the blue, that kind of that, those two little bridges, you can't see them, but, but he said that there were 600-foot colonnades, a pair of colonnades coming off the southwest corner and coming into the temple. That's where the soldiers ran and they would keep control over the temple. See, their boot was on the throat of the Jews who were often rebellious. Why would they build this huge fortress, 36-acre fortress, and then let them build their worship center up there and then live somewhere in obscurity in the city? No, they had the temple mount. And the Bible says they went down the steps, got to the door, and took them back up the steps. It cannot be on the temple mount. Here's the western wailing wall. 
A lot of you raise your hands who've been to the Western Wailing Wall, right? Okay. Have you been down below? It goes down, what, 30, 40 feet from what you see here? You've been down the steps? Okay, it goes down 30, 40 more feet down to the foundation. Here we are underground. Now, when you get to the bottom and you get to the first stone, you see where those, those, those people are standing? That's the first stone. That's the first layer of stone that's placed there. Nothing else was there before. It's the, it's the cornerstone, it's the first stones, it's the first layer of stone, it's the first course of stones. Nothing else was there before that. So that's, a, that's an interesting place. That's where it all started, the Western Wailing Wall. Who is said to have built the Wailing Wall? You look up and you see the Herodian stones, right? Herod the Great, right? Has anybody heard anything different in their whole lives? Well, I want to tell you about a discovery recently that dismantles that. Herod the Great supposedly built th that wall. Eli Shukaran met with me, took me aside. He said, Bob, I went down to the lowest layer of stone. And I took a little shovel and I dug underneath it, just seeing what I could find in the lower level of stones. And he said, I found a, stone, a little coin. The coin is of Valerius Gratus, who was the prefect of Rome under, under Tiberius Caesar. This coin is dated to no earlier than 20 A.D. Herod the Great died in 4 B.C. Herod didn't build the Western Wailing Wall. He was dead almost a quarter of a century when that first stone was laid. So we have an interesting problem here, don't we? How does, what does all this mean? If you look at the old pictures in Jerusalem, you walk around and you see in Jerusalem, you're going to see the south end of, or, the, or the city of David is, is, is sort of, it, it used to be, but 1930s was a field of farmers. There was nothing there. No buildings to speak of. It says in, in Micah 3.12, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruin and the mountains of the temple like bare hills of the forest. Eusebius is quoting Aquila here and said, Zion shall be plowed and Jerusalem shall be a quarry of stone. It is, said for the, it is sad for the eyes to see stones from the temple itself and from its ancient sanctuary being used for the building of idle temples and of treasures for, or, in, or, or theaters for the populace. There was nothing there. The stones were carted off and used for other things by the Romans. Second Thessalonians said, let no one deceive you by any means. That day will come unless the falling of way comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. The first, the, the Jews can now rebuild their temple. They can rebuild it tomorrow. In the city of David, they own that land. And the first domino that needs to fall is that Christ, for Christ's return, is the great tribulation period. For then there will be a great tribulation such has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever will be. 1 Kings 9.3 says, I have consecrated this house which you have built to be put my name there forever. Forever. That means forever, right? I've looked it up. In the Hebrew, forever, means forever. I've consecrated this house which you should have built to put my name there forever. In other words, the temple will always be where the temple was and is and shall be. Zechariah 6, 12, 15 says, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, Christ, from his place he shall branch out and he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory of the Lord and, shit and, <laughs> and sit and rule and reign. <laughs> I'll get fired for that one. And <laughs> sit and rule and reign on his th throne even though from... Afar shall come and build the temple of 
the Lord. Zechariah 8, 2 through 3. I am, now this is a fascinating verse. I am zealous for Zion. With great zeal, with great fervor, I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain, which is the temple. I'm zealous for her, thus says the Lord. I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain, the temple. You see, the final arbitrator should not be my intellect or Chuck's intellect or William's intellect, all of us. The final arbitrator is the Word of God. The Word of God should be the final mediator. There are a lot of pastors who have called me and said, I just don't agree with you. I said, well, show me where I'm wrong. Here's the book. And they said, well, I haven't read your book. I just don't agree with you. And we love to have our traditions. Aren't they comforting to have? Aren't they, aren't they comforting to, to hold on to? Jesus says in, in Mark 7, 13, your traditions will nullify the word of God. Traditions are mentioned 13 times in Scripture. Most often they're very, very negative or to follow the word of Christ, the apostles, completely and totally. And as a cop, I have to look at this stuff. And I have to say to myself, can we at least open up the discussion? Can we at least debate this? And to a lot of people, it's no, case closed. I did a straw survey at the, at the, at the Temple Mount, and I, I went up to the Wailing Wall, and I asked all the people above 40 a question, uh, is there anything I could give you that would change your mind if this is the temple location, the, the walls of the temple? None, not one person. I did a survey of people 16 to 25, they all went, cool. This is great news. It's very interesting how the young people are saying, okay, show me. This, this is hard for me even to, to, to discuss with you because I know it's, it's already angered a lot of people watching this and, and they're sitting here. I want to close with... Uh, with telling you about what happened to uh, what happened to my father. I got a call one afternoon to go to the hospital to see my father who had had some tests and they showed that he had cancer in his body and that he had uh, two to six months to live. And uh, I sat by his bed and I, I got the strangest comments from him. We would never talked about the Bible. We never talked about God. We never prayed once together. He said to me, why do you look for Noah's Ark? I said, well, Dad, the Ark is just a just an old boat, but it, it, was, it was so important. I said, it, 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 I said that the, 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 the people that were on the ark survived and those off the ark perished. And I said, uh, you know, one day that people were standing out in the fields and eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage, exactly what we're doing today, right? We're not doing anything different than they did then. Family concerns were a little different, you know, dress and a little different food, a little different technology, but people are people then and now. And all of a sudden, a glob of water came spiraling out of a sky that was now darkening by the minute. And the water started coming down in sheets and sheets, and all of a sudden, the water came up to the ankles and the knees and the thighs, and the women would grab their children. I can't imagine the mothers in those days frantically trying to put children under their arms and wade through the debris as it's flowing around them and going up to the side of the ark and pounding on the side of it till their fists were bloody pulps. Noah must have had a lot of relatives out there. But the cries could go unanswered. 
because the door was closed on the ark. You see, you're either on the ark or you're off the ark. And if you're on the ark, you're saved. If you're off the ark, you perish. There's no spiritual Switzerland. There's no hanging on to the world and hanging on to God. It's time that we start saying that we're going to be on the side of God and his word and all that it says and all the truths that it says. Dad said, uh, like, what are you trying to say? I said, well, you've got to accept Christ as your Savior. Gave him the Romans Road speech. You know, we've all heard it, and we've all said it, and we've all been a part of it one way or another. He goes, oh, I've been such a bad man. I've been such a bad man. I said, you know, when Jesus was leaving Jericho, he was walking away, and these, these, these peasants were, see, these, were sitting there, these, these, these people and were dirty, filthy beggars, and cried out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And he said, bring them here, and he saved them. I said, Dad, we're all sinful. Ladies and gentlemen, if you knew what God knew about me, you wouldn't have asked me here today. And if I knew what God knew about you, I wouldn't have come. <laughs> Dad said, I'd like to be on the ark. He reached up with these big mitt. He had a big hand. He was a big guy. But his bones were kind of almost creaking in my hand. It was scary to see that his, his face was sinking a little bit. This man that used to terrify me was now a scared child facing the abyss of death, and he didn't know how to handle it. He says, I want to be saved. I said, Dad, the only solvent that can wash away sins is the blood of Christ. The only collateral you need to get into heaven and have forgiveness of sins is the blood of Christ. And with tears flowing down his face, and I, I saw these tears as he screamed out, Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And as he sang those prayers, tears were coming out, down his, his face, and they're washing away years of cigarettes, smoking and drinking and swearing and being just a horrible, horrible person. And he opened his eyes and he looked at me. And folks, he was born again. He, he, he called my brother Paul in. I don't know if Paul's watching this, but, but he, he called my brother Paul in. My brother Paul, great guy, comes in the room and, and dad goes, read me the Bible. I said, Dad just accepted Christ. He goes, no way Dad accepted Christ. I said, he's just, he's like, he's a, yeah, he accepted Jesus. I mean, I just prayed with him, and look at him, he's crying. And my brother says, okay, he opened up the Bible. He says, where do we start here? Book of John. He starts reading, and then all of a sudden, hours go by, hours go by, and Dad said, keep reading, keep reading. He was like a giddy little child. We went home that night and about four in the morning and I was looking out the window and couldn't sleep and I saw the, you know, you see these lights going off and the street lights and stuff in the distance and, you know, the city's so still at night. The phone rang, pierced the silence, picked up the phone and first ring, it's my mother. I said, they're just pulling a sheet over your father's face. Now, you know, when you have fathers like that, it's a love-hate relationship. But at that moment, I had a big grin on my face, not because he died, because I missed all that time of fellowship with him. The reason I smiled is that I will see him again. You see, we're in a scary world. The place we want to be is in the ark and not out of the ark. I, I cannot thank you enough for being here. I know there's going to be a lot of questions about the temple. I'm sure a lot of you are, are upset or confused or angry or even maybe even happy about this. 
but I believe that this is the place of the true temple with all my heart. And I believe that we're about to see some big changes in the Middle East. And, and I believe that, that God has allowed me to be just a small, small part of it. I'd ask for your prayers because it's going to be a difficult road ahead. I, I, you know, Chuck Missler going over there and Lewis and Ron and the team going over there and giving me encouragement means all the world to me because what we're talking about is a world-changing discovery. But the thing is, it's arrogant to say that we'll discover anything. God will reveal things for his purpose and his glory. And he can take a crazy cop that looks at himself in a mirror and crashes into a car. <laughs> you know, I, uh, people say, oh, you're a great explorer. My wife just laughs at that because she says, when we leave church on Sunday, you can't even find the car in the parking lot. <laughs> See, this is the road map and the compass in life. If you want to find lost locations in the Bible, it's, the, it's a great resource. If you want to learn how to be better fathers, parents, children, co-workers, leaders, doctors, lawyers, it's all in this book. This is the instruction manual. The Bible is prophetically, contextually, and historically accurate. I said this last night, God is the Father, salvation is the end, and truth without any mixture of error is the content. The Bible is and shall remain to the end of the world the supreme standard by which we should live. I want to thank you for having me here tonight. Thank you.